Thank you. We open the meeting then and we are up to 8.4, which is, um, yep, we're right, I think so. Recommendations on land and water regional plan governance through to notification. Uh, so yeah, you, as people remember, we did a health check of the um, program and identified that uh, in terms of project management oversight, uh, the government governance group could play a really important role if it um, narrows down its focus a little bit and doesn't um, doesn't uh, try to do two things, which was uh, doing that project management oversight and also um, running uh, policy direction through that group. Um, yeah, that, that function of project management's really key. So um, you've read the paper. Anita, is there anything else? No, I'm happy to, happy to take those read and answer any questions that you might have. Yeah. That is moved. Um, we're just, Lloyd, are you? Oh, I was just kidding myself. Yeah. Happy to second once there's an additional uh, motion's added. <laughs> I thought Lloyd was. He's got. Oh yeah, sorry. I'll just. Yep. Multitasking. Oh, mail. So I haven't got. I haven't got it up. I think I'd just like to add a, um, another um, another motion to the list of noting that the land and water governments group um, has a dedicated has a dedicated chairman as recommended by the by our um, review from the project manager. And that the, that we have the dedicated chairman be the chair of the council, uh, chair chair Robertson, and with an alternate chair being um, Edward Ellison. The reason for having Edward Ellison as the alternate chair is basically that he was being um, in the room for the process from the inception over two years ago, and he's he's um so he's been on the he's been on the full journey. He's got a full understanding of requirements and the and the the proposed terms of reference to the meeting, and I think he'd be um, awesome for the job in the in the in the instances when Gretchen can't make a meeting. So I'd like to move that as a. a not sure it'll be a new motion, I guess. Um, so, yeah, it can just be a um, month. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so you're. Uh, I, I was going to comment on uh, this particular uh, eight point four, Ron, aren't we? Uh, sorry, I just haven't got. In front of me, but um, I think it's timely that we have this review. Obviously, after the thanks, Alan, um, after the um, external review, um, reconsidering the scope, of which Lloyd has just spoken to, uh, the form and function, um, you know, splitting clearly, uh, defining the two roles um, from policy work and versus the project management has got a bit messy, um, a, a little bit. Um, uh, can only be more efficient and effective going forward, splitting the two roles that are very clearly defined and they will come across, um, you know, the desk in, in their separate forms. So it just makes perfect sense. So as I say, it's a timely uh, that we re-look at it now. So thank you for that external review. Thanks, Councillor Moon. Uh, just trying to remember, have you kindly recorded who's moved and seconded? Yes, I have. Oh, yeah, that's good. That's fine. Um, as long as we've captured that, anyone else? Then I've got Councillor Laws with his hand up. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I've got a couple of questions. Um, I need, sorry, so I, I'm sure there's a simple answer to it. Um, but previously, the membership included any councillor who wanted to go along and contribute. Is that correct? Uh, so through the chair, the terms of reference are allowed for any member any councillor to sit in, yes. Right, and, and and does this motion stop that? Yes. Okay, that's the first question. And the second question is, the particular governance group here, when they make a decision, does it require to come back to the council for confirmation, so the debate and confirmation? Apologies. Uh, through the chair, the governance group doesn't have any decision-making powers, <coughs> so they will make recommendations that will either be directed to the committee or to council. Okay, thank you. 
Thank you, councillors. Um, anyone else? No. Okay. Uh, Kylie, have you recorded the? I just didn't capture the name of the other co-chair. Oh, yeah. oh. It's an um, alternate, is it, rather than Nolten, a co-chair. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Okay. yeah. Alternate. Thank mm. you. Edward Allison. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. I'm hoping you're good. Yeah. Um, so it's as a dedicated chair, um, which is my, oh, you've got that up. So it's the Land and Water Regional Plan Governance Group is a dedicated chair, that's me, and an alternate, Edward Allison. Okay. Yeah. Radio. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we can put that then. All in favour? Well, can I speak to the motion? Sorry, I thought we'd already had the debate, but you're right, you're right Councillor Laws. Um, if you'd like to speak to it, you can. Yeah, thank you. I was asking a question before, but now... Yeah, you know, that's, that's fine. That was my mistake. Sorry. Okay, that's all right. Um, yeah, I, I, I'm sorry, but I, I can't vote for this motion. Um the concept that you are going to now give to unelected people uh, such a persuasive and suasive role on the council uh, over and above elected councillors when previously they had been able to attend and place their views before this governance group is just wrong. And it seems that this government's, this council motion today is adopting the co-governance principle of 50-50 uh, as well, which is something I wasn't aware that we had actually discussed as a philosophical motion around our table. Um, but it is clearly obvious in the membership of this governance group that three will be elected members of the council and three will be iwi representatives. Not Maori representatives, no, iwi representatives. Now, I don't know how you get to 50-50. That's beyond me. The Maori population of Otago is, as we will discover in a paper later on today, assumed to be about 9% of the population. But within that 9%, iwi, the mana whenua, if you like, would be an even smaller proportion. Perhaps not even half. So how a group who have roughly 5% of the population of Otago could end up with 50% of the representation of the government's group makes no logic to me and is clearly anti-democratic. Um, I have no difficulty with engaging with, consulting um, local mana whenua or iwi or Māori on the issues as we go forward. But this is a governance group and it's adopted a principle of co-governance 50-50 um, and excludes nine elected representatives from a governance group of which they were previously potentially a part. Um, this is wrong and I will not be voting for it. Councillor Callaghan. Thank you. Yep, I totally agree with the previous speaker. Um, I won't be voting for it. Uh, I think um, it is a decision-making group, even though it's stated that it isn't, because it sets an initial direction, and then uh, beyond that, it's almost incredibly impossible to change. Uh, and um, also, too, I think um, uh, recommendation four, which arrives at uh, two uh, Runaka members um, and one Mirahuku member, and then uh, resolution six, which states the names of um, those of who will be chair. Uh, what if Edward Allison wasn't one of the Runaka members for whatever reason into the future? So I think they are in conflict. But either way, um, if it proceeds, I won't be voting for it. Thank you. Hey, thank you. Uh, Councillor Mifam. 
Um, just for clarification, um, <coughs> I, mean, I was sort of unaware that it excluded the rest of the councillors, um, this motion. What is the reason for that exactly? So um, this group was formed <coughs> when? Quite a long time ago now, um, more than that probably. Uh, and 18 months ago. What's 18 months ago. Oh, okay. Yeah. Governance group. I think it was longer than yeah. that. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, anyway, a while ago, um, and uh, you know, it must have been near the beginning of the triennium because, yeah, it was anyway, you might be right, it feels like a long time ago. Um, and it had um, Councillor Noon and myself and um, three EWE reps. Uh, at that point, and we also had the provision for the FMU councillors that were involved in the policy that we were considering at that point um, to come along, so only them. Uh, and then it became, uh, when we were discussing regional type issues, uh, that all councillors obviously, regardless of which FMU they were um, appointed to, needed to be involved because they were, um, yeah, they were, we were dealing with all FMUs at once. So that was because we were dealing with policy type guidance at that group. Since this review, we've found that actually there's a real need for project type governance oversight of are we on track? So those type tables with the traffic lights um, type of thing where we look at is this on track and um, for, for example as an indicator we were looking at what is it monthly um, meetings that would be less than an hour that does that type of thing. It doesn't need to look at all of the policy guidance because actually that should be handled rightly so, as other councillors have just pointed out, through committees, round the table, um, transparently, uh, and either, yeah, at a committee level or at council. So that's where we have got to. Um, and actually, we had two councillors and three iwi before in that grouping, mm -hmm. and this is proposing that there would be three councillors uh, because Councillor McCall is actually the co-chair of um, Environmental Policy and Science, so that makes a lot of sense um, in terms of project oversight. So that's kind of where we're at mm -hmm. from my perspective. I might have missed something, I don't know. Yeah, Councillor so, Mifa. So are there some terms of reference that you've got? So yeah, that's what the recommendation is, that staff, direct staff to amend the terms of reference for the Land and Water Regional Plan to reflect the decisions made in this paper. So would that come back? So if I could just provide some clarification, the terms of reference were brought to the April Council meeting yeah. in uh, Balcothra and we laid them on the table for this paper um, and the plan would be that the updated terms of reference would come back to Council. And this gave us some guidance for them in writing up those terms of reference, which would come back. So it's basically a project management group. Yeah. That would, yeah. yeah. Um, Councillor Malcolm. Uh, yeah, look, I just think we've lost a wee bit of a track on, uh, I can understand why this group is being formed. And if it is the project uh, oversight, um, A, certainly, and in recommendation three, A is correct. Uh, B, surely that should be covered in the um, Environmental and Science and Policy Committee where we have full every representation. So surely that Tamana Otawai oversight should be done in that part. Uh, so I just wondering why that is actually, and why are we taking it out of the group that's actually handling it and taking it back to another group to relitigate again? So, you know, I, I just think that that part, so, so it's it's about ensuring that this process is uh, on track, risks are understood, and we're moving forward. So, um, and and to me, um, B should be should be being carried out where we where we have full representation of EWI at at the Environment Science and Policy Committee, where we have the opportunity as as, as governors to discuss that with them and understand what's happening. Yeah. I think you're right that it does need to be discussed uh, there probably as well because that's important. But um, 
Yeah, the ability to have those conversations is really important, first of all, and we've got an established relationship and being able to do that. Uh, but it's a, I think you hit the nail on the head as well in terms of risk. Tamana or Tawai is integral to the um, development of the plan. So um, if we're off track on that, that's a major risk and we're better to have identified it nice and early. Uh, and then we can talk about that issue, uh, as you suggest, um, in committees or it's an elevation <laughs> issue type of scenario. But yep, I hear I Yeah, hear but surely if, we're, surely if we're um, having that in front of mind at the Environment at Science and Policy Committee, if that's at the front of our mind, that is uh, ensuring that that risk is dealt with there uh, and it, it just becomes another part of the risks for the oversight of the Governance Committee. So, yeah, I, I just think it's in the wrong, yeah, comfortably in the wrong spot. It should be with the group that, and that, look, to, to, be, to be fair, that's where the inks came from the original setup where we were having policy direction set by, or it appeared, um, and I'm not saying anyone's doing anything wrong, but it appeared that there was policy direction being set by a very few group of people, a very small group of people without the involvement of other governors. And that's why uh, the governance group then morphed into being a uh, another committee structure where everyone could get along and put their um, contribution in. So, yeah, that's, I think it's tomorrow. So it's tomorrow night, well, we'd have to go up, come back and go forward and rediscuss. So I, I think it should be being done with our iwi, with, with our iwi partners sitting in the room at the Environment Science and Policy Committee. And your governance group really, um, to me, should be, should be probably uh, three people maximum, uh, which would be the chair, uh, Councillor Noon, who's been on it right from the start, and um, because we're right through this process, would be uh, Edward Allison, who's been right at the start, because they should only be looking at managing and including the risk of, uh, oversight of the project. Okay, that's um, a point of view. Yeah, are there any other matters for debate at this point? I'm happy to do right for five minutes. Councillor Somerville. Yeah, look, I, I'm happy with this proposal, and I think that's appropriate to to confine define the government group, group responsibilities very closely to those two matters, and to have that close <coughs> mana whenua input into the bit about the implementation of Tamana Otawai at an overview level. And I imagine, in terms of the policy stuff, that would be more detailed things would be coming to the the Science and Policy Committee. So I'm happy to support this as the paper says. I'm happy to support it as it is. So I hear your comments and I think it should also be in that other committee and there, but uh, Te Mana O Te Wai is the basis of where we're going with this. So I just don't believe that you can have a governance group without that, um, you know, that focus there and it needs to be outlined as it is here. So I, I, I'm happy with that. I'm also happy with the number of members. It's, um, it's really important. And uh, I think this is the best way of making it succeed with having those responsibilities spread in that way. So I'm happy to support it as it is. Thank you for taking on board what you say, Kevin. Hi. Um, Got a mover and a seconder then already. Uh, I think I'll just put them all together. You've got what Kyle, oh, sorry, oh, you did ask for a greater reply, Kate. Thanks, Richard. Yes, sorry, so, Kate. Um, I'm going to support this. Uh, this has been a fraught process, but I think at the back of this, we have to remember that we have made an undertaking to get this plan out and we have to keep the wheels spinning. Um, I have probably been at blame as much as anyone for being participating in this and um, and extending um, the length of the meetings as any, um, anyone else, but they have been really um, good debates. If those debates are going to be had somewhere else, which is exactly what good governance should be, because we need to get the 
risks dealt with, the principles dealt with, and the actual discussion should be around the table with everyone. That has proven absolutely necessary today because we've had a long debate this morning, and I don't want to extend this debate because we're way over time. But this morning's debates were all about stuff that we have actually dealt with in those meetings and had people taken their opportunity to participate, we wouldn't have had to need to do again today. So if we're just going to do it once, let's do it once, um, at, at the council table. <coughs> the other part of that, though, is if we then put the vulnerabilities of having a cultural discussion around the table for everyone to try and have their tuppence worth with, um, so that's an old fashion military term that you probably aren't aware of, um, that, um, what was it before 67, um, unlike the rest of us, um, <laughs> anyway, the um, Bumble yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, the issue there is that the um, we don't put them in a safe position to have that and actually give us that guidance, which we should be listening to. We can't slow it down, uh, and it's, we need to empower the staff to get on with us meeting those principles and then giving us those um, hot papers to discuss around the table. And that is clearly obvious from my experience for the last uh, some considerable time being involved in these. And I apologise for any delay that I may have caused in that process. No, it's been really great input and um, yeah, it's just time for a bit of a more efficient and effective approach. But thanks to everyone who has been um, involved so far. It's been good. Uh, Councillor McCall. Can I just, yeah, just, can I just say that at the end of the day, we've got the recommendations come from the project we the review from the project manager is exactly what it says. It's a group that's going to be um, have a very narrow focus, uh, narrow terms of reference around the delivery of the project on time. It's the council's number one project this year, and it's probably a number one risk right at the minute. So we need to have the we need to have that that concise um, oversight and and have people taking responsibility for it. We need to take responsibility for it as in the delivery of the project, but also. That we do that we do um, fully implement demand of the why, and if there's any issues that they're flagged really early in the process. So that's really it's about getting the flags and getting a good monitoring system so that everybody, so that we so the whole council knows where the project is heading, and then the whole council also has the input into the individual papers through the science and policy workshops and committees, etc. So yeah, I think it's I think it adds good clear direction. Yes. Madam Chair, Can I a point of clarification, we're about to put up. Yeah, yeah, it is. It is. Okay. Um, I have done my writing reply. reply. Yeah. Okay. My writing reply is so the last. Of someone else I, I appreciate yeah. that, but yeah. I just. So if you, it's open. <laughs> Sorry, can I have a point of order or not? Yep. Thank you. Um, I just want to go to three B to ensure implementation of Tamana Otawai. Now, words mean what words mean. Can I ask if that now, and it's a question before I vote on this issue, does that mean that this governance group is now responsible for ensuring the implementation of Tamana Otawai on behalf of the Otago Regional Council? No, that's not true. So, um, yeah, that's a fair enough point. Um, it would raise uh, matters of risk, I guess, around to Mano to Y, um, and as I said, elevate it so that it can be handled through um, other channels of implementing something. So, um, yeah, because ultimately we're talking about policy here, it would need to come to a channel that creates policy. So, no, it's not going to be implementing anything. So Thank we should be voting on something that we're not that doesn't mean what it doesn't mean, does it? So you've just clarified that 3B does not mean what it says. Now that means surely that we need to amend the motion to um, solidify what your ruling has just been. Councillor Noon thinks it can help. <laughs> so. The MPSFM talks about giving effect to Tamano to Y. Uh, implementing Tamano to Y is essentially giving effect to it. So this is the framework that's set in Wellington. So we, whether we agree with it or not, um, it's a bit like driving 50Ks in a, in a 50K zone. If you do 75, you get pinged. So, you know, these are, this is law. So that's my point. 
Yeah, OK. Um, we've got assistance on this. <clears throat> but we should it be then to ensure that Tamana Otawai is given effect, uh, effect is given to Tamana Otawai in policy direction? I think implementation actually means the same thing as giving effect. Oh. Oh. No, that means... The means of the thing. Radio it has been put. We've actually had a right of reply and um, the second also right. spoke. So, yeah. Uh, division, division, please. Radio. All right. Councillor Forbes. Yeah. Councillor Callagher. Against. Councillor Laws. No. Councillor Malcolm? No. Councillor McCall? War. Councillor Neffin? War. Councillor Moon? Aye. Councillor Somerville? Yes. Councillor Weir? Yes. Councillor Wilson? Yes. And Councillor Robertson? Yes. So we have three against and seven four. Eight is up. Seven four. Just uh, checking we've got it recorded. So right. I had against Councillor Kelleher, Councillor Laws, and Councillor Malcolm. Is that correct? And seven yeah. Yeah. Oh, Brian, sorry, Councillor Neffin. Yeah, and we're just trying to. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so thank you. Yeah, thank you. So, yep, that is one. Thank you. Uh, annual report on regional climate change collaboration. Welcome, Francisco and uh, Andrea. Alrighty, we have the report and we have read it. Thank you very much for preparing that. Uh, is there anything that you wanted to highlight to us? No, I just wanted to thank the councillors for the all the uh, engagement around climate change. I'm looking forward to some questions. Great. Yep. Let's get into it then. We're um, short on time today. Sorry, Francisco. So we're. Um, Cutting off, luckily. Time you have every day. Oh, I know, <laughs> that's true. Thanks, Kevin. <laughs> Any questions? Can I ask a question? Yep, okay. Do you think, in light of the public forum this morning, that we could or should move more quickly? Of the, uh, um, sorry, I'm just trying to help out a wee bit, but it's kind of a strategic council kind of discussion. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. I think um, risk of putting staff on the spot for mm. giving okay. advice That's or fine. something as broad as that. <laughs> <laughs> I would hope that the yeah. public forum this morning gave councillors um, something to think about as we move into mm. strategic priorities for our long-term plan and where you might choose to point the organisation in the direction of, but I probably wouldn't be that comfortable putting that on staff right. That's absolutely fine, especially given other context. But that's yep. uh, I, I really appreciate what you just said, Richard. Thank you. And I appreciate this report, um, Francisco, but I have the same concern <laughs> as I think where Kate's uh, question, unfair as it may have been, is coming from. And then I um, want to think that that we as councillors might actually think about and consider and perhaps, I don't know, talk um, with our communities in whatever ways we do, how the community preparedness to move faster um, might be. And maybe that's something we can all consider. Is there more we can do? Can we do it quicker? Are people willing to engage with um, more stringent um, or strident steps towards uh, climate action or countering some of the climate change mitigations. Yeah, so I just, it's not a question, except to us as councillors rather yeah, than to you. I think that's the thing, isn't it? Yep. Are there any questions? Oh, sorry, Lloyd. Yep. Oh, yeah, just on um, my question, just around number 16, around um, doing your um, emissions inventory, your, your gas emissions. I was just wanting to confirm I oh, just wanting to make sure that um, sequestered by forestry includes exotic and native forestry. Correct. 
and and also what about um other biodiversity sequesters of carbon i think it includes sequestration that's recognized in the greenhouse gas inventory guidelines um, I haven't received it yet, so I can't comment on whether uh, it includes the non-traditional sources of sequestration. That was that was my question. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Alexa. Remember your oh, question. Apologies, yeah, I actually have a note here, Lauren. And and I wondered, yeah, you've got this, the the, uh, the climate officers group around the region. I'm wondering if that has um, waste minimization specialists in it as well, because I've been having some conversation with some people thinking our waste plan isn't up for it and they seem to be bashing on a what year. So does this does this this do the, these uh, officer groups mm -hmm. include waste management specialists is my question. Can include waste management specialists, but it's been Kind of just the climate officers that's been associated with um, each TLA so far. Um, that being said, I know that there is like a regional level working group for waste officers, um, and I know that the mayoral forum has been doing some work in coordination around that. And my next one would be: Does this risk siloing if we don't have a more collective group? I think the terms of reference um, that that we've drafted. Um, Kind of makes it clear that uh, any the councils can send um, whatever staff that they want, and we we've been wanting to theme our meetings around uh, various topics. So, for example, if we were to theme one around climate change and waste, and um, people who are waste officers would be able to go. Uh, similar to when we had a discussion about um, adaptation, the people who were um, kind of responsible for that were able to go. Um, even though they usually didn't go to the meetings of the group. Thank you. That's great. Sorry, you're not chair. I'll just add that the two principal advisors that are involved in both climate change and um, waste minimization from ORC perspective are all under the same manager. So that will at least um, mitigate the silos within ORC. Thanks. Um, Elliot. I just want to ask you for this. Uh, if you had any thoughts on how the zero carbon alliance is progressing. I think the zero carbon alliance is making uh, good progress. We've received uh, at a staff level a draft of the zero carbon plan, um, and we're just reading through that. Um, but yeah, I think it's, it's making solid progress. Perfect. Yes. Uh, any other? Oh, yeah, sorry, Ella. Oh, just so I'm happy to move those recommendations if we are ready to do yep. this. Good one. We've got an over and a seconder, Ellen and Elliot. And yeah, I just wanted to say thank you. We've actually got a whole lot of work streams in place here. Uh, so there's been a lot of progress in this space in the last few years. So that it's great. And I would probably unfairly cut you off in terms of um, what are the next steps and do we need to do more? Because actually we've got a whole section there, which is future areas of work. And um, yeah, the next bit would be us doing a scope, scoping out a program of work centered around the development of a regional climate strategy, which would be a really big step forward too. And in terms of um, us um, thinking about uh, long-term plan and strategy, uh, we could make room for that too. And there's some work going on there, I know. So um, thank you for that, as well as the work that's going on um, with uh, adaptation uh, and emissions reduction planning too and what our role is there. So there is lots and you probably could have answered that. So sorry, I cut you off on that one. Um, we need to move on from this paper. I'm gonna put the recommendations, but just thank you very much for the ongoing focus in this area, which will help us regionally. Thank, thank you. you. So recommendations are there, um, there are three of them, and yeah, they're unchanged from what you've got in front of you. So I'll put those all in favour, aye, 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 against, carried. Thank you. Uh, the next one then, thanks very much, guys, is the Otago Wellbeing Baseline. 
Oh, we have, yep, James Adams coming forward and Andrea staying as well. Welcome. Thank you. I'd like to introduce the team that you have with you today. Of course. Um, yeah. Me and Andrea, you already know, on my right are Penelope Coleman and Justin Lester from Dot Loves Data, who prepared this baseline report for us. Fantastic. A fantastic job. Thank you. Did you want to give a quick intro, any thoughts, or uh, did, would you like us to just um, take it as read? I think we're happy to take the paper as read and yep. take any questions that you have. Sure. Michael Laws. <laughs> How much did this cost, please? That's the first question. And the second question is, why were Kotata Insight from Wellington engaged when there were researchers and available academics in the same area from Otago University available? Was there a, um, if you like, a, a process where people were invited to tender for this role? Yes, there was a tendering process for, for both processes, for both developing the framework and also for gathering the data for the baseline indicator report. Kotata Insight was engaged to lead development of the framework itself and Dot Love's data were engaged to do the actual data collection. And the cost? And the cost? The cost for the baseline report. Yeah. Uh, well, for the entire pro yeah, for the entire for the report from, from go to work to get from where it got to to where you are sitting there now. The framework report cost approximately eighty seven thousand dollars, and the the indicators report cost approximately fifty five thousand dollars. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions? Oh, Tom. Um, I noticed in point forty-five that the Targa Regional Council doesn't have any influence of over any of these indicators and outcomes, and its influence over them was indirect. What is the perp What are we gaining through all of this? What, I mean, how can we make things better? I noticed that there's some significant weaknesses. Um, how how can we improve them? Yeah, so we do not have sole influence over a lot of those indicators. As we mentioned in the in the workshop we held in February, although we don't have total con control or influence over any particular area, our activities do reach quite extensively into a lot of areas of community wellbeing. And across those, we work with a number of other organisations to help holistic wellbeing for the community, this is an important indicator of how well-being in Otago is going as a whole. Our role then strategically is to see what our part is in that and to work with the other agencies that are working in that space to work towards holistic well-being. Yeah, so I'm just, I'm just wondering about the application of it. I mean, for sure. obviously, if we've got weaknesses in connected communities, um, we, we actually have to look at how we make that better. But I mean, how do we do that as an ORC? Uh, through the chair. So um, you'll probably remember through our strategic planning sessions that we're, we have held, and we'll have another one tomorrow, that connected and communities and resilience are some of the priorities for council. So... Um, that is one opportunity in which we can pad out exactly um, the types of roles that we can play in that, whether we're facilitating, leading, supporting, enabling direct initiatives. The other, um, as the recommendations refer to, so this type of work, and um, our consultants might be able to talk around how other um, organisations have taken the information and used it to uh, help direct a different outcome. But... Um, where I've uh, experienced this is that we, um, through some mechanism, whether that's um, within our own council or with all of the councils around Otago, 
look at the data, understand what it's saying. So first of all, at the baseline level, it's um, providing more information about where energy needs to be directed and an understanding of our communities. If, it, if we're talking about crime or well-being, um, it's just really looking at then what are the interventions that we could do collectively or individually and what's our level of comfort with those and having a program of work and implementing that. So the sky's the limit, really. It's a matter of how much we want to invest in terms of time and energy and who we want to work with. Yeah. So these were nine priorities and other um, plans, any plans and long-term plans as well, I take it. So, yep, everyone has a focus on, it is required to have a focus on wellbeing. So um, at, the, at the moment, council is playing a role, um, a lead role in the development and dissemination of data and information to make it easy for other people to access this. I, I hope you don't mind me taking this angle, but it's just, I'm, I'm sort of supporting Michael a little bit, so a bit on this one. So I haven't done this much before, but um, it does seem as if, um, this report into well-being is sort of like an added extra. I mean, we seem to be doing a lot of this stuff. We're focused, we're focusing on we're reading through our plans, and we've got this as well. What was the I mean, what was the initiative in, in conducting this this report? So the the further chair, the framework um, allows us to actually measure progress. So that's the that's the um, one of the uh, key outcomes of this first report is that we've got a, a, a baseline, a starting point. So then when we do do things and through our long-term plan with our, um, with our uh, EB partners, with other agencies, we can actually measure whether it's made a difference. I don't know if um, Love Data wants to respond to, you, to this. Yeah, very much and happy to do so. And thank you for the opportunity to be here. Uh, my name is Justin Lester and this is Penelope. Uh, look, we're based in Wellington, but I hail from Invercargill just down the road. Lived here in Dunedin for five years uh, and am a rate player with ORC with um, some property over in Central Otago as well. So we know this area pretty well. Uh, in terms of um, why this is important now and why is this a groundbreaking initiative, well, it's the first time you can actually measure data at a community or local level. And that's why we're seeing increasingly more and more councils uh, around the country are doing exactly that. Up until now, StatsNZ has been the main port of call uh, in order to understand how communities are performing, but it doesn't happen at a local level. It didn't go beyond sub-regional level, certainly not to the territorial authority level, and definitely not down to the community level, i.e. analysing individual suburbs. So what you've got here is um, you've got an ability to improve things because you've got a benchmark for the first time in your history, for the first time in, in New Zealand's history as well. And you can't improve what you can't measure. Um, so you didn't know what was happening in terms of um, deprivation analysis. You didn't know what was happening in terms of real GDP uh, at a local level uh, divided up by territorial authority. Uh, you didn't know in terms of how the housing affordability necessarily uh, at a suburban level, um, how Dunedin compared with Central Otago or Queenstown or Clutha or the Waitaki uh, district. Uh, so this gives you that ability to make good decisions. And look, I don't know your annual operating budget. I assume it's somewhere in the vicinity of $300 million. Um, but in order for you to make good decisions about where you prioritise your spend, uh, you have to have good information. And so over time, look, this won't change in three months or six months or even a year, but over a five to 10 year period through your long-term plan, you can reprioritise funds on where it needs to be directed. Uh, and to give you an example of how it's been used in other locations, so Rua Pehu District Council, uh, they use type of information to take a, a business paper to government and they receive $5 million in uh, housing investment uh, directly from the government because of their high deprivation levels in places like Tomaramili, which they hadn't been able to understand prior because of being lumped together with Waiuru and even as far down as Palmerston North because that's the one or two Wanganui district as defined by Stats NZ. Tomaramili, as they then understood, only had like a 30% employment rate with 70% of people out of work and they'd never been able to analyse that previously. Uh, so there's good level for opportunity for investment, uh, both private and public uh, at a governmental level and also just understanding where communities need more support. So here in the region, look, Otago is doing incredibly well. Um, I know there's been some media commentary around aspects that need improving, like there is in any place. But if you look at uh, fulfilling uh, well, the first dimension um, around fulfilling and healthy people, uh, fulfilled and healthy people, you're number one in the country. And that's uh, across a range of different metrics. In terms of um, real GDP and median hourly earnings, uh, yeah, there's an ability to improve some of those, but you've also got to take into context that um, 
there is a large proportion of people in the region, specifically in Dunedin, uh, that are students. Mm -hmm. um, they, they contribute to the economy, but they don't contribute production-wise uh, because they're here to study. Um, so you've got to take it on a per capita basis and understand that that's what brings down some of those median hourly earnings. You've got a whole raft of people who aren't in employment uh, and aren't intending to be. Um, but generally speaking, it's a really good report. It's the first time you've had a benchmark. And from here, you can focus your priorities and, and spend on where it needs to improve. Thank you. Uh, Kate, you were first. Thank you. Look, um, I appreciate having a benchmark. I, I think uh, if I look at your graphs on you know, healthy natural environment or um, uh, a good standard of living, some of these are perception rather than um, actual measurements, isn't it? So, I mean, if we're not telling a good story about how good our environment is, then people won't necessarily know that as opposed to that it's not a measure that we've got a bad environment, or is it? Um, no, on the, on the environmental measures, they are actively measured. Um, it's lower data, and it's data collected by you over time okay. in terms of the measured sites. Um, they will <laughs> fluctuate depending on um, various different events. For example, a measurement, um, and you'll know this better than I will because I'm not an environmental scientist, um, but can, can depend on rain events, for example, yep. can depend on what's happening right. locally within a specific site. So, for example, in Clutha District in one year, um, you had 100% of swimmable sites, and then the next year, or over a corresponding period, um, it was 0%. Uh, that doesn't mean that um, you know, it's a complete disaster or crisis. It means that the measuring period showed different results. I think well, on I, that... Sorry, that, that one I understand. And then, so a connected community, your information for that is what? Census driven. Census -driven. Uh, so that is yeah. subjective because it's self-reported. Yeah. Uh, and absolutely, uh, you're right, it's subjective. Some, some are perception, some are yes. data. Sorry, but thank you. <laughs> and just on that for community, the community, because that's one dimension, mm -hmm. but it only has one metric in it. Yeah. Whereas some of the others have you know, as many as, as a dozen, if not more. And because it is subjective, it'll fluctuate. And there's no, um, no necessary consistency between an Otago or a Wellington because it, it can be subjective to regions. So I wouldn't be too harsh on yourself in that respect. Got um, Elliot, Kevin, Michael, and Alan. But I just thought it might be useful to note as well that I'd be keen to move a, um, the fourth recommendation, being that the um, mechanism to respond would be that the report. Um, goes to the mayoral forum essentially for discussion um, because yeah obviously we need to be thinking about this um, regionally things will need to play out locally uh, and whilst we've collected this data across the region it's um, pretty important that we're not the only people um, implementing any opportunities going forward and I really liked that um, that example you gave around health because that is a very topical one in our region as well well um, in terms of deprivation inland and um, that's just one example there'll be lots and I can see them playing out effectively in mayoral forum and um, matters are being shaped up there that we can work on so that would be what I'd suggest so you're moving all four with those last words for the I'm just preempting because we're still in the seconds. middle of uh, yeah um, questioning and I don't want to cut people off and Elliot you're next that was going to be my question. I was yeah, going to ask cool. if a uh, so you came for the formal cross council working group reporting to the mayoral forum. Uh, no, I think that we should not create a cross council group at this point. Um, I think that it's important that we do this collaboratively uh, and discuss with our. Um, uh, with the mayoral forum, whether they want to do that, first of all. Yeah. Yeah. So my question was going to be about the benefits of that. Maybe it's yeah. sort of moot. I think we should take it back a step and have the discussion first with um, mayors. Yeah. And CEs will be there as well. Yeah. Uh, thank you. So, yeah. I'll ask, anyways, though, assuming the mayoral forum did yeah, the yeah. cross um, council working group, what would the benefits of that be as opposed to an internal um yeah um so i've seen quite good examples of um using the new zealand quality of life survey which at one point had 16 councils participating it's dropped back now but um 
the mechanism that we used for that, and this is you know quite some time ago, but um, we would basically analyze um, and look at the trends and data and then form a work program. And with the collective, I guess, powers of those different um, organizations partner up. So when there were declining um, trends in crime, we would get New Zealand police in. And so I guess um, in some cases, there'll be similar issues to try and resolve. So it's the collective power. Um, also, we've got different levels of um, staffing and capacity within across the region as well. So some of the smaller councils, I think, would appreciate um, a bit of assistance. But um, it really needs, you know, in, in order to give full effect to the benefit of this, we need to kind of collectively work on what needs to be done and come up with a plan and actually implement it as opposed to just leaving that data sitting there and describing a problem. Thanks. Oh, sorry, I did have a list there. Um, Kevin. Uh, look, I was simply going to move the motion, but I just particularly wanted to have noted uh, bullet point number 39, where a target's last performance is in, and probably where we should be concentrating is, is our connected communities and an enabling built environment, which is uh, two key drivers uh, what that ORC can influence quite dramatically. So, um, and that's our last performing area, so it makes sort of sense we should be able to think about it. Oh, I need to say Thanks, Kevin. Uh, Michael. Sorry, are we in debate or in questions still, Madam Chair? Oh, that, that was a question. Am I correct in assuming that? We are actually in <laughs> questions, Michael, um, at the moment, but I preempted that um, just to help people with the direction. So, yep, we're in questions. Okay, thank you. Um, can I ask, uh, well, I think one of the authors there, I'm sorry, sir, I can't see you. It's just the way that um, work room set up. It's, it's my apologies that I can't. But you um, mentioned um, why this uh, was important, this report, and you cited the case of the Rua Pehu District Council making a business case for, for housing stock. Um, everything that I've seen in this report seems publicly available information, or alternatively, the Department of Statistics gather this information with mesh blocks, which is much more precise than this, as you know, uh, and goes into, you know, sub-regional and also into suburban um, detail as well. Um, so I'm struggling as to why we need to measure um, stuff that, or need to get a report when all this information is literally out there. Um, and I think you note that in your appendix, you give all the data sources and they're clearly publicly identifiable from victimizations coming from the New Zealand police to life expectancy from Statistics New Zealand. So um, I know it seems a moot question and you're probably the wrong person to ask, but I'll ask you anyhow. Why do we need this report again when all this information is there and publicly available? Um, through the chair, um, so one of the prime reasons why we're presenting this today is that um, council uh, requested that information through the long-term plan. So. Um, that's the first point. Um, yeah. to then um, add to that. Yeah, thank you. And it's a very good point, Andrea. Um, because while it may be publicly available, it's never been brought together. And it's never been brought together specifically for the Otago Regional Council nor its constituent territorial authorities. And it's never been benchmarked and analysed relative to other parts of New Zealand. So the other regions, the main metropolitan regions of so Auckland, Wellington, Christchurch and Otago, but also the other 66 territorial authorities around the entire country, excluding Chatham Island. So that's the most important point. But also, um, yes, the information is collected, but it's not analysed, it's not publicly available at that territorial authority level. Um, you have to distill that data, uh, you have to adjust it and process it and, and bring it to a level that can be analysed. And that's what we've done through this process. Uh, we've built a tool internally, we've got 35 data scientists that we employ in Wellington from around the world, uh, around the country, and they do that work. And that's allowed us to distill that uh, to a level that you can analyse here. Uh, and um, you wouldn't, you certainly wouldn't see it at a mesh block level. Um, by Stats NZ, we can ask for it and we can process it and visualise it, but you wouldn't receive it publicly. Uh, you wouldn't even see it in the SA2 level, which is the next one up. Uh, and very seldomly do you see it at a territorial authority level. Um, but uh, can I give you an example? You've measured loneliness. Um, I'm stunned by that. Where on earth would you have got that information from? Are people lonely? Uh, and then can I ask why? 
when you measured educational achievement, you only took one barometer, which was Maori kids leaving NCA level two. Are they the only ethnicity that's important in gathering the wellness of Otago and its educational set? Um, so in terms of loneliness and its measure, it's reported individually at a household level by people completing the census. So that's done on a five yearly basis. Um, so that's how it's collected, it's subjective, um, but it's data that um, is used by the New Zealand government and therefore territorial authorities across the country. In terms of the metrics that were collated, uh, that wasn't determined by us, it was determined by ORC uh, through the initial uh, framework report from Kotata Insight. Uh, and then we have collected the data that you requested. We've also come up with some recommendations around things you could collect in the future, including proprietary and private data sets you otherwise wouldn't see in public and which uh, are now available and you could get access to. Things like business performance, um, you know, consumer spending and tourism spending data. So there's a whole range of things you wouldn't uh, otherwise see there. But just on education, uh, no, it's not just about um, how Māori are performing, uh, but that's around the quality. Uh, and we know that uh, Māori um, traditionally uh, don't perform as well educationally as, as Pākehā children. Uh, so it's around how unequal is the education system within a location. And in that respect, Otago performs incredibly well. Uh, it's one of the more equal places in New Zealand. Um, and so that's, I think, a bonus for the region, um, but also um, to add, Educationally, the entire Otago region performs incredibly well, um, specifically Queenstown Lake, Central Otago, uh, but Needham itself, you have some of the best um, NCA level three results uh, and certainly access to tertiary education is the strongest in the country and Dunedin City specifically. So I think, again, uh, being able to analyse it, lift this up and bring it all together can show where one thing does well, sometimes it can master consequences in another area. And if you haven't brought that together in a benchmark report, you don't know. And you have to monitor it over time to be more consistent consistently. Any other questions? Oh, Gallon. Yes, thank, thanks. Um, for some of the indicators in the Cortata framework, data wasn't really readily available, so those weren't measured. So how important is it to get further data to get a better picture. So for example, on that community connectedness conclusion, it's not relying on just one set of data. Um, if that's a, um, I think what more data can do is help us be more Otago specific through time. What we've done is draw on the most readily available indicators from StatsNZ, but there is potential if we sort of dig further into statistical sources and perhaps in the future do collection of our own that we can get much more locally specific and appropriate data that will help us further. I think what the, the data we have does is start to highlight some points that we might want to dig deeper into and where we might want to further develop the framework over time. We don't see this report as a as a final report, it's a beginning report, it's a baseline. This is a, a place where we start from so we can grow and develop this monitoring to make it more effective and more useful to us in the community. Thank you. No, that, that makes good sense just as the suggestion that we've got the starting point and can build on and get a better picture as we get further information and make use of it in the future. Thank you. We've got some uh, recommendations up there. Kate, were you doing something with them? I can't remember. I'm happy to yeah, just move have, them. The re recommend. I'm just happy to second your Yeah, motion. you're seconding. Yeah. That's great. I, um, I think it has yeah. been recommended before yeah. the word that. It needs to be something oh, that. sorry. Recommend. No, it's not recommend. Do we Request just do through. something? Oh. That the council that recommendation the council request that the well-being be presented. Request yeah, okay. Request. Oh. So yes, the chair to present yeah. the well being report and the mayoral forum or something like that. Just request. Yeah. Yeah. No, the council's already in there above it. Yeah. yeah. So just the word request. request that. that the... Sorry. We just have to have an action that's it's always. Really just that. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Kylie. Yeah. Oh, so yeah, I just want to say thank you very much because um, we gave the direction that we wanted to gather this data on well-being. Um, 
And yeah, as we know, we have that um, within the Local Government Act in terms of what our role is, which is promoting the social, economic, environmental and cultural well-being of communities now and in the future. And that is us, but also the TAs. So I think working together in this space is really important. Uh, we're showing some regional leadership collating this data, which is going to be useful to uh, actually not only just the local governments sector but beyond as well it is really powerful to have knowledge at our fingertips of what the reality is in our region so um, thank you for doing that um, and yeah bringing all of your expertise with you um, to help us um, with us the first report which is a baseline so um, yeah it tells us a limited amount doesn't it but gives us a bit of a snapshot so appreciate that and just want to note that I can see I've got uh, Michael with his hand up wanting to speak too. Thank you, Michael. Uh, thank you. Um, listen, I'm having a bit of a day today, so I'm sorry about that. Um, in a previous life, I was a parliamentary researcher. Um, and I have to say that I think a smart year 13 student taking a Google search for available public information could probably have produced this report and save the Otago Regional Council $142,000. Um, Madam Chair, that, uh, there's no need to uh, say that. We ran through a fair process that yeah, was tendered yeah, and we've established that. So that was the fair process. Wait, wait, wait on. <laughs> I'm just saying, this is what I, am yeah. I allowed to freedom of speech on this or not? Thank you. Or oh, within, okay. boundaries, within boundaries? <laughs> no, 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 there are no boundaries. Don't be ridiculous. I'm entitled to actually say what I'm about to say, and I have said that this, I think, is a waste of $142,000, which is exactly what I've said. Um, and if that's offensive to you, Kevin, you've got a problem. Um, the, the truth of the matter is that... Um, uh, have you got ears for listening? Okay, everyone. Have you got ears yeah, for Michael, listening? Listen you to you're interrupting me again. No, can you, Madam thank Chair, you give us order? order? Oh, yes, I'm, I'm trying to establish order. Thank you. Thank All you. Right, Michael, go. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, can I also say that um, I think, though, that the failure is not with Kotata Insight having asked these questions, but it's with us collectively and the instructions that we gave on this issue and the sort of woolly ideas that we have about what well-being is, which we didn't actually define, and we left Kotata Insight to go and find some statistics that they thought might fulfil um, that basic, uh, if you like, um, definition. So I don't blame Kotata Insight at all for this. Um, the failure is ours. I'm then struggling to see what we're going to do with what is clearly publicly available information, which we could simply ask if we want to. The worst part that comes out of this is that we apparently intend to use it as a baseline and repeat the exercise again. I can't imagine a more ridiculous waste of public or ratepayers' money um, when if the idea was that spending $140,000 on just collating information that's already out there is considered a good idea. We now intend to use it as a benchmark and then do it all again in three years time. Although presumably with some new additions as to what we're going to measure. Um, first of all, we need to ask ourselves, what is the question here? What is the Otago Regional Council's statutory role? Uh, and we have strayed well off the reservation on this issue. Um, but the second issue is, what on earth is well-being? Um, when we define well-being as whether or not Maori kids leave school at the end of NCA Level 2, but we don't worry about Pacific Islanders, even though we've got a large Pacific Island population, particularly in Kevin's uh, bailiwick, um, or we, you, know, you can self-perceive whether or not you're lonely, or have you been a victim of crime lately? Yes, but the definitions keep changing, don't they, with what the police regard as victimisation and reports. Um, then, you know, we, we have simply set anybody up who's going to research this to fail. I'm very disappointed in the exercise. I think the outcome is predictable. Um, and if we're going to continue on doing this again, we're simply going to be throwing good money after bad. Anyone else? Uh, Elliot, thank you. Um, I just wanted to take us all back to the workshops. Um, that was my first experience in sharing. Um, but that took us through uh, everything that we've talked about today um, and why we're doing this, um, as well as what 
well-being is, but um, we do have a statutory role here, uh, both to collect the data and and and, and improve uh, the statistics in the region as well um, as the regional council. And I think the best way that we do do that um, is to you know first collect the data, which is where we're at now. Um, continue collecting it over time, so we it's actually of use to us um, where we're improving, where we're not improving, um, and then develop a plan with all the other territorial authorities on how we can actually improve the well-being of the people in the region because I think that's what we're here to do is is to improve the lives of and the environment of of, of our region and, and anything that can be done to do that I don't see why we wouldn't be doing that um so I'm excited to see uh where this goes with the mirror forum and, and comes back to us um and if you want us to vote for these motions Thank you. Keep on. Uh, look, I, I'm going to support noting this paper and the motions that are there. Uh, my real concern, and they they do uh, echo the concerns of council laws that uh, spending 142,000, we we need some outcomes and we need to, to gain some direction from it. So I think there actually is a a baseline that we can uh, certainly generate some good thought. But I would be very concerned if, in fact, we don't. Uh, and going back to Paragraph 39, where we are the low, our lowest performances in connected communities and enabling the built environment, mm. uh, that we don't get something pretty quickly back from uh, back from the territory from the mural forum mm -hmm. that uh, starts us heading down a path to correct that, uh, which is very very poor. So that that would be my key measure that we get something straight back. If we don't, uh, if we don't get something back from them, we actually need to probably take that initiative. Because otherwise, it will be uh, one hundred and forty-two thousand dollars not spent in a very good way. But I'm ha happy with the report and think it will give us something to work on. Lexa, I didn't feel I needed to speak to this, but I just want to really support uh, what Elliot said. We were very clear in our workshop about why we were doing this and where we were going with this and the application that it would have across every single department of our council. I'd like to see this taken up as we've discussed at the Mural Forum and I really urge us to be looking at how we can take this across everything that we do. Yeah, we do have a um, level of service as well to collect information on Otago Regional Wellbeing that's in our LTP too. So we knew well and truly what we were doing here. Thank you. Councillor Callagher. Thank you. Um, oh, look, it's information and we've received it and what we now do with it is important. Uh, my concern is around the cost and um, there there will be a cost to the um, small updates that may happen over the next two years. And then this will be more expensive again in the third year to do it again. So when we are going to be under some pretty substantial rates pressure uh, and cost pressure as we look at our long-term plan, then um, I look, we have to do the best with what we have uh, with the detail that's been provided. But I would be very concerned about looking to repeat it into the future. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you. Look, uh, thank you for the work. Um, I think that democracy is a wonderful piece that is at the moment um, really tenuous because we've lost a connection. And that's um, our role and the review of local government requires us better to actually understand our community and to reflect it. Now, if we don't understand it, and this is sort of core based stuff, knowing what we have that is required to understand the change we need. The reason I ask my questions is I think some things are perception and the more we bellyache around here trying to find our points of difference rather than our points of agreement. Um, but thank you, Michael, for the word bellywhack. I hadn't come across that. That was great insight. Um, the, the, we, we, we are frustrating democracy and us going forward together. I think some really challenging things here and some are less challenging. I think we, what this will help us in the long-term plan is to prioritise what our time and effort goes into, whether it's actual improvements or just changing the perception, which both equally difficult tasks, but may require a different um, type of investment. So thank you. Um, yes, it will need to be done again. I've come onto a council that I'm frustrated often because we can't tell the story we, where we are at, and therefore we can't say if it's good or bad, and we expose ourselves to bad stories generally. If we measure things and we can concentrate on the things we need to change, that's important. If we can tell a good story 
and help our people feel good about themselves and know that they're doing good. That actually is equally valid um, actions on our behalf. And I think we've spent too much time just saying this, oh, everything's okay, without actually measuring it. So yes, it's expensive. Yes, validating stuff is expensive. But actually, that's um, if you can't validate a story, then you haven't got a story to tell. And we have to start telling the great story of living in, in Otago and how good it is. Thanks, Andrew. Thanks, Madam Chair. Um, it's sort of turned into a more of a budget debate rather than <laughs> the focus on you know, yeah. the, the report in front of us. But anyway, um, from time to time, we've got to put our head above the parapet and, and, and see what's going on out there and having an external look and a detailed look, 33 indicators um, uh, of where the focus, a broad focus. And, you know, just reflecting on the ODT's focus on or, uh, the headline was a negative headline, but actually, when you go into the report and realise that there's a lot of positives, yeah. and in paragraph ten and eleven, we're focused on the um, on the positives and the the not so um, we say um, bouquets and brickbats or whatever, the bouquets outnumber <laughs> the brickbats. So I like to think that um, not blaming the ODT for the headline, but um, you know I hope that they, <laughs> did, I did, that they did read the full report, um, and clearly having a baseline to be able to. Um, launch, I suppose, a more detailed focus or a lens on exactly what the issues are and where we can assist. And just reinforcing our responsibility around the table in terms of focus on well-being. So it's very, very clear in the Local Government Act, very, very clear in the Resource Management Act. Um, our responsibilities and focus um, is pretty much why we exist, uh, is, is really um, ensuring that we are able to deliver an improved uh, way of life across the board, whether it's, you know, people focused, environment focused, uh, socially focused or, or culturally focused. So that's why we exist. So thank you. Thank you. We had a fair chance with this paper. So those recommendations were up just before. I think we know what those are. Over and second has already happened. So I'm going to put them all in favour. Aye. 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 Against. No. Yep. Against. No, the same. <laughs> Thank you. All right, 8.7 electoral system. Yep. Thanks, Richard. Yep. <laughs> Thanks, Tim. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, Amanda. So a little bit of an intro that might be helpful. Um, just um, yeah, there's, there's, there seems to be some people who think that a poll would be required and things like that. Just what we're sort of considering today and what the what we could do today. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So this is um, the decision making here is provided for under the local electoral act. Um, council has the opportunity to consider every three years. Uh, whether which electoral system um, they wish to use. If a change in electoral system is voted for or as results, it's then in place for the next two, two elections. Um, but the, the background, I guess, for ORC is that every time this has come up over the last three years, no decision to change has been made. Uh, if counts, so council's got options, which we've outlined in the paper. Um, if a decision today was made to either stick with first past the post or change to STV. Um, we are required to put a public notice out in the newspaper, well, various forms, and then the public have an opportunity to demand a poll. And so if 5% of eligible voters uh, demanded a poll, then we would be required to hold one and there's requirements around that in the, in the legislation. Uh, council also has the opportunity to signal a poll itself. So I think that's probably the nuts and bolts, but very happy to answer questions. Sure. Yeah. Uh, Elliot, I think you had your hand up first. Oh, but... Preempting a motion. Oh, yeah. Preempting a motion. Yeah. Uh, move the recommendations um, and for two would be, be to right. change to STV for 25 and 28. Second. Okay. Yep. But we will go back to questions at the moment yeah. to make sure everyone's clear. Yeah. 
uh, Alan. Thanks. Yes, well, at the appropriate moment, I'll tell you why I think STV is a good idea. But I wanted to ask about, we've got option E in there, which is in the mean, is bringing a paper back in August, and in August, and in the meantime, undertaking engagement with local territorial authorities, because I think it really is important we keep working on those good relationships with our TAs. What, um, what might that engagement look like? Uh, so that could look like however I guess council wanted that to look like. That could look like staff engaging with um, governance, you know, governance equivalents to um, let them know what our what the council's thinking. It could look like um, perhaps the chair taking it to the mayoral forum to discuss um, where the council's thinking is at. It could look like letters. Um, it, it could be as formal or informal um, as council wished it to be. Yep. Thanks, uh, Kate and Michael. So taking that um, further, if we, if we make this decision, I presume these questions. Sorry, the, our other territorial uh, the uh, territorial authorities, or at least four of them, looking at changing their voting. I could at tell, all. I and, tell you that off the top. And others. Okay. So it may be that if we um, and if we did E, it would give them an opportunity to try and have an Otago wide voting system. You know, in the best of things, and and the question then could we also share if there were a need a poll? Uh, we would still have to do our own poll, and so we could a joint poll. No, because here we all each local authority has to make the decision around its own um, electoral system, so we couldn't do a joint poll as far as I'm aware. Um, but we could certainly, you, in terms of engagement, that would be two ways. So you would get into potentially get indications back from other councils on what they're thinking. Okay. I just note the time frame is quite tight, so the decision council has to have made a decision by the 12th of September yeah. under the legislation, so there's not a lot of time. Okay. Um, oh, Michael, you're next. Well, there is another option, and that is, um, given that none of us have a, engaged with the community on this issue at all, um, and that would be to do what territorial authorities did in some um, constituencies at the last and the previous local body election and that is have a referendum on STV um, or first past the post at the next election so if we're going to do bring a paper back could we consider that as an option too please I am aware of at least two territorial authorities that went through that process and allowed which seems to be the right thing to do the electors themselves to choose the electoral system that they wanted to use in the future by way of referendum at the same time as the local body election. Yeah, well, that's in the paper, isn't it? As yeah. an option. Thanks, Michael. Yeah. Uh, Kevin. Yeah, I just concur with councillor laws in that uh, Dunedin City Council is the outlier. Uh, so it would seem to me appropriate that we did, uh, did it as a, yeah. At, at the next election as a referenda. And we are and yeah, we are actually representing the whole of Otago. So if I look at the Dunedin, which is one one small geographic area, the rest what? of the, <laughs> the, the the rest of the province is still under first past the post. So to get the opinion to make a decision for the whole of Otago, I would think that, that and I would have been able to do it last time, but yeah. It's just half the population as well. Yeah. <laughs> Rightio, so yeah, is there any other questions to... then at this point so that you can then, um, <laughs> we can put the, uh, well, we can then have debate. We've already got someone preempting that they're going to move a motion. Yep. Yeah, thanks. Um, question just for you. Um, of my question, just for my understanding, so if we as a, as a council now decide that we want to change the voting system, does, does it then have to go to the people or not? No, so through the chair, if you made a decision today to change to STV, what we would have to do under the legislation is put a public notice out saying that council resolved to change the voting, the electoral system to STV. The public now have the right to demand, to countermand a poll. And so if they met the 5% threshold, so 5% of eligible electors demanding a poll, what would then happen is depending on the timing of that being received, we would be obliged to run a poll. Uh, and the poll would say, so I've just had advice this afternoon, the poll would, would say 
uh, do you wish to use STV or you know STV or FPP and whichever got the most votes as part of that poll would then be the voting system for the, the electoral system, sorry, for the next two elections. So that we decide to stay the same? Uh, the same thing could happen, so we has to still have to do a public notice. We, a notice. There's still the opportunity for the public uh, to demand a poll. So if it went over the 5%, we'd, we'd have the finance having a poll. Yeah. Can we change our decision? Sorry? Can you change your decision? I think if a poll's called... That's that, have to regardless it, you know. of what our initial mm. decision was right yeah. now. Okay. So we, can gonna, we can move those motions in, Elliot. Okay. They're still there. You were preempting them. Yep. <laughs> I'll speak to it at the end. Okay. You're still seconding. No, I'm just going to force us a poll that, you know, I just have to be careful about that. It does. Yeah. It could the be forced. Can be forced either way, though. Yeah, mm, true. Yeah. Um, yeah. You don't have to. Stand no, on you, know, you know, I'll, I'll see you. You know, I'm, 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 right. So yeah, we're clarifying what's what been moved as B. One and two B. Three and four. And yeah. Three. Okay, so get rid of A. Mm -hmm. Two and three. Well, you could just highlight which ones we've got there in case we need those words again. Oh, yeah, sorry, that's it's good. Yeah. C, D, and E have to go as well. Mm -hmm. C, D, and E. Sorry. <laughs> Okay. Yep, makes sense. Um, Alan, then. We, is this for debate? Yep. Right, Alan, thank you very much. Look, yep. I'm very much in favour of FSTV, and that is because I believe it is a much better voting system and makes much better use of electors votes and also there is evidence to show that it's more likely to bring about a more representative council for example i don't believe two-thirds of the population of otago is 60 something year old pakeha men as represented on our council um, the future of local government report too has recommended this is one of their recent recommendations now who knows when those or even if those will be enacted but probably they will at some stage so it's likely to be coming as well as all the evidence they had um, collected to to make that recommendation thirdly um, because Dunedin City at the moment uses STV, that's actually about 57% of our voters. So all of Dunedin constituency and slightly more than half of Molyneux constituency are using STV. And so though those other local authorities are not, in terms of our voters, most of them are. Um, I also think it's important to um, you know, keep, keep working on the best relationships we can with our fellow territorial authorities. And that is why I would actually favour talking to them and coming back in August after hearing their views, including the view of Dunedin City Council, of course, um, because that's an important part of our voter base. So that's where I'm coming from on that one. Thank you. Alexa. I support um, Alan on this and agree with, it, with everything you said there. I am wondering about how we go about chatting with our territorial authorities about this. I think it might not be a bad idea. And there is some mention of it in this report, but I'm not sure how that actually works. Right, so that's all you wanted to say, that you think yep. we should consider talking to a territorial yep. authority? Yeah, I think we should again. go ahead with where we are, but I think we should consider talking to them as right. well. Um, I'm a fan for STV, and I prom promoted and got the support of the last council to do that as a poll at the elections. In our attempts to save 75000 though we took it off the agenda, the local government commission was... Uh, that, yeah, we're looking 
not the government commission, but the ones the review. Yeah, yeah, the review was going down that line and thinking, as they had indicated, that it would be the recommendation and possibly even enacted before uh, before our poll would have been given any effect. So, in order to save seventy five thousand, I acquiesced to it going off our work plan. Um, I'm now regretting that. Um, yeah. But anyway, uh, I, there are four, uh, four reasons why I support it. And uh, um, Alan's articulated some of them, but it's actually not about who necessarily wins the seat. It's about who stands. And um, I think that in first past the post is quite a cruel and difficult place to get traction um, if you're new and trying to be a voice. Um, and STV is a much easier way to um, campaign and, um, and to, uh, because you've got much more chance of getting on with it, uh, being a wide but diverse uh, representation. Um, it does give a much diverse, I think, uh, council generally. And I come to this table and love democracy because I am challenged by other people's ideas. I would hate to come onto a council full of people with the same ideas and just saying yes to things. That would be boring, but it wouldn't it reflect the very um, the range of the community we are. And if, if we're all agreeing on something, then I do wonder if we are representative. Um, but I also think, and someone living in Dunedin at the moment gets six votes. Someone living in Moraki, should there have been an election, gets one. The really good thing about single transferable vote is that everyone gets one vote. And that's the key. It actually equalizes us. So I think that's really, really important because it does give those um, outlier, those smaller areas a real voice around here and equal to the, pe the people that are in the um, bigger, uh, bigger centers. So that's why I'm going to be supporting it. Uh, it just makes sense. And I think it's a way that local government will go. Everyone is very aware of single transferable vote because until a couple of elections ago, they all used it in the Southern District Health Board and have had to get their head around that, should they have exercised their right to vote at least. And if they're interested in democracy, they will get their heads around it now. There is some amazing literature about it. So highly recommend it. Have to support it. Thank you. Um, I've got Michael, Gary, and then Tim. Um, the reason why our table looks like it does at the moment, Kate, um, and um, is because these are the people who stood and who were trusted by their electors to represent them um, and the interests of the Otago Regional Council. Um, this idea that somehow STV is going to change the composition of the council table is ludicrous because the same people will be voting, whether they are voting under first past the post or STV. Uh, and what we know about local government is that the more vested you are in your community, the greater your financial air stake, but also the older you are, the more likely you are to vote. And that isn't gonna change under STV. In fact, you might argue that because it comes a much more complex system, that in actual fact would scare off those who might think about voting when I'm suddenly faced with having to rank candidates one to whatever it's going to be. So there's no proof that STV in actual fact produces a more diverse outcome at all. Not on the basis of local government in New Zealand. The second is, um, isn't it amazing that people who profess to like democracy now seek to deny it? If you're going to pass this STV motion today, you're in actual fact denying the opportunity for every elector, every ratepayer, every resident in the Otago region for having their say on this. It's no skin off your teeth to have a referendum in 2020, uh, what would be 2024? None at all, 25, sorry, none at all. And then everybody will be able to choose the system that best suits the Otago region, but oh no. And the other thing is that none of us campaigned on the basis at the last election, or it certainly wasn't considered anything likely, as in this will be the electoral system that we'll move on. The Otago Regional Council has never considered this issue actually until every three years. We made the wrong decision three years ago. We should have put it out to referendum. We've got that opportunity now. And if this motion is not carried, my I will uh, foreshadow, Madam Chair, 
a motion that we have a referendum at the next local body election, which will mean that there'll be a no additional cost. And then there's the next issue. This is quite a passionate issue for those first past the posters, as well as it is STB. 5% isn't a very difficult um, and uh, threshold to grab uh, for a poll. In addition to which, we would then need to have that referendum outside of the electoral cycle. The cost would be significant. It'd be in the hundreds. It'd be in the hundreds of thousands of dollars. So, um, all right, uh, I've foreshadowed the motion. But can I just say to those who are supporting STV, I've got no problem if you believe that. Absolutely none. But I think that you should let every elector in Otago who pays your salaries and the salaries of everybody who works for the ORC, given that it's their money and their investment, it should be their choice. Thank you. All right. Gary. Um, thank you. Yep, here I go again. Uh, yeah, to me, I'm not particularly worried whether it's STV or first past the post. Um, this is the process that puts us in place around the table. Uh, and, um, and because of that, I think it's absolutely critical that the ratepayers make that call. So then you look at the process for them if the current motion uh, is passed. Um, yet again, more cost, more effort, more grief. Um, whereas with a referendum in uh, the next election, the most cost-effective way with the um, facts, the explanatory facts that will support it on the table at the time for the ratepayers to make a call, uh, and far better, or far more likely we'll get a bigger representation of ratepayers making that call. So, uh, yeah, I won't be voting for this motion, um, and I would support the proposal for a referendum if that does get in play. Thank you. Um, uh, much the same, really. I think diversity of representation depends on who stands. Um, STB may be a, a better system um, than first past the post. Um, one thing I did note in the last election was that the ORC had, um, I think, a 48% voter turnout, which was one of the highest around. Um, that would tend to support that people didn't understand the first past the post system and were happy to vote that way. Um, the other councils in Otago are using first past the post. Um, if the ORC um, went to STV, um, it, would, it would potentially confuse other voters around Otago. Um, and I do agree that a referendum should be held in the next election. I think the voters should determine um, the voting system and not the sitting councillors. Hey, uh, Andrew. Thanks, Madam Chair. Yeah, a couple of things. Um, Alan referred, when he spoke, referred to the makeup of this council. Um, some reference, and you looked at me and I thought, all of so us, I all like of us down this. <laughs> but in the 2019 election, there was 50% female, 50% male as a result of a uh, first past the post election. So my preference isn't um, 2B, but it's 2E. My reasons for that is that, you know, we just had a report, uh, the previous item, where um, it was, you know, about measuring well-beings, and Madam Chair suggested that, um, you know, it needs to be a conversation with our partners, our TA partners across the region, about whether they would be interested in um, working together on the on the on the item rather than just sharing it immediately and accepting that they would be interested in it. Uh, Madam Chair suggests they have a conversation on in the same space uh, that we should be talking to the TAs, um, like in 2E, where we get some feedback from them. And, and Tim's just alluded to the, to the obvious, where there's going to be a mix of uh, potential, a mix of, um, of both STV and first past the post. And you'd, you'd say that that mix already exists in Dunedin. Um, yep, sure, but there would be a change for those um, other uh, TAs, which could cause confusion. Um, but yeah, so that, that would be my main reasons. And it, I think it's a significant decision as well. Uh, it's not something we should take lightly. Um, I think it's something that we need to do some more groundwork, such as 2E, um, get a bit of a barometer across the region and then uh, make a call uh, beyond that. The referendum at the next election would be uh, my other fallback position. Thank you. Mark um, 
firstly, um, who sits around this table is elected by our constituents. Um, you'll note that the Moriaki constituency had no election and the feedback that I get from, uh, from young and old, uh, no matter what ethnicity they are, that they are happy with a pale old male to be representing them because he has the ability and has proven the ability to represent their cause. So um, I, I actually do take hundreds right throughout society of people saying that we're stale, pale and male. Well, I may be a pale male, but I'm not stale. Um, we, have, this is, we have experienced around this table uh, since the start of this triennium, triennium, the importance of engaging with our communities. And here we are about to undertake a major fundamental change, A, on the way how we're elected um, and, and considering that, and yet we are not, uh, if we vote the way that this motion is put up now, we are not actually consulting with our community. I, I find that uh, absolutely amazing. We have, we have got the option, and it's already been expressed, to go to our community with a referendum to be conducted the 2025 election to, to, to determine our voting method. Now, if we want to hold, uh, and look, I, it doesn't worry, actually worry me which way it goes, uh, but in reality, I think this is a, a major change that must be consulted on, and that would be the most cost-effective, the best way to do it. Uh, and I've heard figures of, did I hear six fifty or six hundred thousand dollars to to do to do a poll now? Uh, a poll will be instigated if we, uh, yeah, a poll will be instigated if we change. I'm sure that would be because it's only five percent, and I know I'd have to get them from outside of the Dunedin. The rest of the the rest of the province is at first past the post. Um, yeah, I would hope we would do it as a consult and engage with our community. We haven't done that yet. We haven't even engaged with the TAs, uh, and they won't have time to do it now. They're all going through district plans and all sorts of other uh, took trauma within. Um, let's go to a referendum. Uh, is there anyone who hasn't spoken that wants to? No. Boy, do you want to? Well, I'm probably guessing on the last man standing. Um, I pretty much don't have a position on it. So that's pretty much my position, but I'm starting to sort of tend towards E. At the end of the day, I think it is important we talk to our communities and we're trying to connect with our communities. But um, I, I think, I think, I don't know enough about it. I don't have enough position. I think at the end of the day, we all stand because we want to be involved and we think we have something to input and the people who get voted on are the ones that do the work. So, and whatever, whatever, I don't believe, I don't think the system is as important as what we're making it out to be. I think it's more about getting the quality people to stand to start with. So I'm going to abstain. Yes. Right of reply, but I'm not sure if you can unless this, yeah, we're debate. Yeah. Saying as debate, but I can also. Not, oh, sorry, I'm not coming along. Oh, you sorry, I'm, talking I'm, to Richard, I'm looking at you, Elliot. Sorry. Yeah. All good. Um, I like going at the end because I can address uh, concerns that have been raised thus far. Um, first of all, I did actually campaign on switching to STV, Michael. Um, during the campaign. Uh, first past the post discourages a diverse range of candidates. It makes it more likely that candidates with only a small portion of the population um, in favour of can win. Uh, it makes many votes wasted, they end up wasted, and people feel their vote doesn't make a difference, which leads to lower voter turnouts. Uh, even in multi-member wards that we've got, um, <coughs> Some voters may not have voted for any of the successful candidates, um, and it can also encourage tactical voting because uh, not ticking, for example, six boxes in Dunedin um, can actually help the opposing candidates. So if you don't tick all six, even though even if you weren't enthusiastic about all six candidates necessarily, um, whereas in single transferable votes system, no votes are wasted. Uh, every voter has some say in the final result, and it's much easier to run, as Kate uh, pointed out, as a new candidate and have a chance of doing well. But it also means that more popular candidates 
don't have extra wasted votes, um, they end up going to other similar candidates um, that voters want. Gives the voter greater freedom of choice, means less, you've got less block voting. Um, and as a number of academic studies have shown, it is simply a fairer and more democratic voting system. Um, and I think based on that, uh, I don't think we need to bring it to a poll. I think that um, it's interesting that some of the council is concerned about wasting money in the last paper. Um, I'm proposing bringing it to a poll at the cost um, that would obviously if we'd want to bring it out a poll at the election to save money, but that's still going to be quite a hefty um, cost to us uh, than just making the decision today to switch to STV. Um, and as Kate said before, the last council already voted to take it to a poll and then change um, their mind. I think a lot of people truly, um, as Lloyd said, probably aren't going to care either way. Um, and so that means they're more likely to be swayed by the status quo in a referendum or poll. Um, but those polls and referendums are also excellent grounds for misinformation, for divisive debates that don't actually help people make an informed decision. Um, people regret their, their votes later. We've seen this in you know, the Brexit, Brexit referendum um, and a number of others. Uh, I don't think we need to take this to the community. I think the community would just prefer if we save that money to do other things. And if we actually just looked at the evidence carefully and made the best possible decision for our community, because that's our jobs, um, as early as possible to give staff time to, to prepare, which I think is why we should decide today to switch to single transferable vote. Um, as has already been said, more than half the region already used the STV uh, voting system. Um, and as Kate said, we've all used it in some sense for the, S, uh, the DHB elections. Um, but I do think there's opportunity for more. We can reach out to those TLAs um, and try and get a, a region wide uh, voting system. But I don't think we need to wait for that to change today. Um, we should absolutely go to the community, we should absolutely educate people um, and help them and, and, and go out to the community as people have been concerned about. Uh, but if we know that this is the right decision, then we make this decision today and we go to the community um, from here with that decision. Uh, STV is an objectively better system. And we're, if we are confident that that is the best decision for democracy in the region, and I am, then we just need to actually get on with it. Um, I think eventually uh, more and more councils are going to be turning to STV anyways for joined in the last uh, local government elections. Um, and I'd rather not be the last council left uh, doing an antiquated, uh, leaving our democracy in the hands of an antiquated system. So let's get ahead of the program and switch to SCB today. Thanks, Elliot. Um, call for a division then. And we have four <coughs> sides being moved at once. Can we have those uh, taken separately, please? Okay. Um, do we, we probably don't need a well, vision on everything, but yeah, okay. Well, the only reason now, yeah. Chair, is that uh, myself and other speakers have spoken about 2E. Yeah. Um, it makes it impossible then if you put them all at once to. Um, yeah, that's fine. Have, have we'll do a division for each yeah. one of them separately and we'll just cross our um, T's and dot our I's. That's fine. Yep. Thanks, Kylie. Okay. So, <coughs> the first one's noting the report. Oh, sorry, receives the report. Receives the report. Mm -hmm. Councillor Force. Yes. Councillor Callagher. Yes. Councillor Laws. Yes. Councillor Malcolm. Yes. Councillor McCaw. Yes. Oh, sorry. Councillor Methan. Yes. Councillor Noon. Aye. Councillor Somerville. Yes. Councillor Weir. Yes. Councillor Wilson. Yes. Councillor Robertson. Yes. Okay, there you go. Next one. Yes, yeah, sorry, guys. Um, the B, which is the change the electoral system to a single transferable vote for the 2025 and 2028 local body elections. Mm. You're not going to vote on A. 
it wasn't good enough. Yeah, 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 yeah. But if this fails, then we yeah, can get your boat. Can we have it? Yeah. Well, it's gone again for me, but yes. Would you like me to share my screen? That would be great, thank you. I'm pretty sure I know what it is, but just checking, I'm saying yes, I need yeah. to. It's just exactly what um, is written it's down. down. It is. Okay. It's B. Yeah. Can I ask a procedural question? Oh, oh, sorry, so, yes. so I I think the reason Councillor Noon has done it this way, calling for division at each stage, is that should this one fail, you will then say open it up for debate for the next option. Is that how you're going to run it? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yes. So on the Councillor Forbes, yes. Councillor Callagher. No. Uh, Councillor Laws. Sorry, no. Councillor Malcolm? No. Councillor Nathan? No. Councillor Noon? No. Did you miss one out? Cool. Cool. <laughs> I'm sorry, Councillor McCall? Uh, no. Councillor Somerville? Yes. Councillor Weir, yes. Councillor Robson, yes. and Councillor Robertson. Yes. Yeah. Right, so that has failed. Yeah. Am I able to move then? We do to E. Oh, he did. Sorry, yeah, Michael did foreshadow oh, right, yeah. um, something. Yep. I'll sit on that one. <laughs> that's a, that's well, okay. He's still happy with that, Michael. If that's all right with you, Madam Chair. Yep, you did. You got in first, and it was um, was it D? Um, no. no. Michael. Oh, sorry. Michael had some words different. in your mouth. <laughs> Which so, one right, did that, you the referendum? Yeah. 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 On <laughs> the preferred electoral system for the Otago Regional Council. be held in conjunction with the 2025 local body elections. Just, just for clarity, uh, Michael, so option D, which signals the intention to hold a poll, um, that, is, that is the referendum as part of the next local body election. Um, that's, that's the option that was included in the paper. Amanda, is that correct? Yes. Oh, it, it, does it spell out, though, that we would revisit that and make that decision again, though? No, it doesn't. So this is this is dealing with the decision, Richard, okay. so that gotcha. it, it'll go to the, at the next election. Okay. Uh, Amanda, though, tell us about the process. Well, I was just going to say, so the reason that we were able to... Sort of the reason that last time around we were able, that council was able to revoke the decision is we hadn't fully gone through the steps of notifying the electoral agent that we were going, so we'd done the public notice um, of the signalling that we were going to hold, council would hold a poll, but we hadn't done the, and we'd talked to the electoral people, but we hadn't done the final step of writing a letter from the chief executive. So the reason that I put it up there was that it just, give council, just gives council a little bit of time if they want that decision to come back to confirm it fully so that I know when we're, fully making all the steps and putting it all in process. Because if we, this time around, now that we know exactly what the steps are, we would start that off if the decision's made today. So it'll be less easy to wind back, I guess, if council then changes. Yeah, so oh, that's right. I think Councillor Law has just said that he didn't want the ability to wind back. But, Which is fine. Yeah. yeah. It, it's no, it's just, we've, we've made a decision on STB. Um, now, the other issue that we raised today was who should decision rest with, and that's what the motion calls for, the decision I'm saying rests with the electors. And that's why the referendum option at the next local body election has been promoted as an alternative solution. Yep, so we're now locked in if we vote no, for this No, we're not yet. Point of, point of clarity around that. But, so do we not first have to do retain if, but because we've got a steps that we've got to do by the 12th of September, um, we yes, not, that's, that's correct. That'll be first a, past. We'll do A first, haven't we? Yeah, that's, that's it, right? Um, we have to have A in there. Yeah. 
No, you're right. You're absolutely right. That's the practical impact of what it is given. You're right. Yeah. yeah, that is the practical impact, but technically you don't have to mm-hmm. make a decision to retain FPP. If you're quiet on that, FPP will be for the next election. Oh, okay. yeah. so but you can, you can make a decision to retain yeah. FPP. It's up, up to you. We don't need to. Yeah. Rightio, so um, Michael's wording on D was slightly different to what we... So we well, he, well, I think he didn't want the end revisit no, us. No. And does it make sense if we just get and, rid of end revisit this prior? Yeah, no, are we not? Yeah, is it, no, it's signal the intention to hold a poll um, and then the time that that poll would be. No, that's not what we'll see. Poll, I think Amanda, I mean, just to clarify, the, referendum. the correct term is the poll. Yes. Yeah, yeah, so, so it the, does that, referendum. That's the correct term in terms yes. of the process. So it's, it's not a referendum, it's a poll held in the election. And the I think from what I'm hearing from Michael, it is agrees to hold a poll yes. as, well, as, as, part that, as part of the 2025 election yep. on the electoral system to be used for the 2025 and 2028 uh, sorry 2028 and 2031 mm-hmm. elections because that's that would be the practical implication mm-hmm. it would be fpp for 25 25 you do the poll at the same time then the outcome of that poll mm-hmm. would determine 2028 and 20 yeah is that right michael yep got that that means we retain FPP for 2025. No, we don't need to do that. We just it does mean we retain it. Yeah, yeah. 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 say it, that's what it means. Yeah. yeah. And we retain it till 2028. That's what it means. Yeah. Yeah. Well, one election. Yeah. Who's the uh, chair? I thought we were going to put each, each ABCD one at a time on the way down. No, because we had a motion that was um, B, so we were taking the actual motion, um, but in its parts, yeah. Um, the thing is, it's going to be tricky to vote for E so if B goes through. But it's- so you can vote for, if you don't like this one, you don't vote for it. For it. If you do, you do, and then we take it from here. That's exactly right. Yeah. Yeah. So, so because we're no longer in debate, because we haven't... Yeah, got, that's right. People can we, just can the CEO, could the CEO uh, tell us anything in any uh, advice that you'd like to give us? Uh, not not so on this. I think that, I, I mean, my view is the debate was very good. There's clearly some views around the table. It was I was going to make some clarification just around the fact that there, there is still a cost associated with that was actually clarified by the last two speakers, that there, there is a cost um, associated with the poll that is just less than holding a poll independent of the elections, um, and also around the conversation with the, the ability to hold a conversation with, the, uh, with our uh, TLAs within the region, um, which wouldn't have been a head, uh, had a decision be made about the, uh, but again, that was also clarified through subsequent speakers. So. Um, look, I, I don't have um, advice for the table. I think this is something that needs to be decided by councillors, and it's good there's been some rigorous debate because it is a, you know, it is a, it's a big um, topic in, yep. in terms of the ability for our community to take part. So I think we just need to make sure we get the wording of Michael's motion correct, and I think that now reflects he wasn't talking about the original D, which was signalling. He was talking about making that decision now. Um, so I just make sure that Amanda's comfortable process-wise that that proposed D. Yep. 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 So the practical implication of that is we still need to issue a public notice, and that public notice will note that council made a decision to hold the poll. Um, uh, that said, the, it, the public still has the option to demand a poll sooner yeah. um, if they wanted to influence the 2025 election. Yeah. So all through the, it, would it, whichever step you take, the, the public has the ability to demand a poll. Okay. Right, Process-wise, just to make sure there is no um, around the question that looks ahead, and, and also, Lord, we're now voting on D because Michael did foreshadow that had uh, B failed. Um, if D fails, then I, I believe Alan may have been next in terms of foreshadowing a, a motion after yep. that. Mm-hmm. 
Okay. Which I think was neat. Yep. Thank you. Councillor Forbes. Um, what was that we're being? now doing a division on this, Tim, oh. unless you need further clarity before Just you vote. Has that been seconded? I'll second Michael's motion if it hasn't been seconded. Oh, sorry. Has this, has this B been voting on this? <laughs> um, D, Alexa. D, D so not so B's failed. Okay. D, 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 D,
uh, taking it to every councillor at every council or every leadership staff for their input. What are we looking at there? I was kind of thinking uh, maybe mayors, but Michael, um, that would be slightly problematic given um, what's happened in the last six or seven months since the election of the new councils. Uh, the mayors don't necessarily, as you've probably discerned, necessarily hold sway with their councils. So an issue on the electoral system isn't something that should be decided by the mayor. It should be decided formally, their input by council. All of the elected bodies of Clutha or Central Otago, Queenstown Lakes, um, Dunedin City. Uh, so really, if you only give it to the mayors, you are excluding everybody but one individual. And I don't think that's consultation of a community nature, nor is it representative of those communities. So I'm just pointing that out to you. Alan. Well, look, I'm, am I able to amend that? Yep. I move just simply to say, bring the paper back to the August 2023 council meeting and in the meantime, undertake engagement with local territorial authorities full stop. And the workshop. I think a workshop's a good idea, isn't it? Workshop too. All right, and organise a workshop. So leave out the other key stuff. So that they actually all know. My intention in here had really been talking to the other TAs. I support those community commitments too. Thank you. All right. The tight workshop schedule have to be quite. Yeah. Yep. All right, everyone understands that one. And have we got all those words up there for you? Yep, looks right. Yep. Councillor Forbes? Yes. Councillor Callagher? Yes. Councillor Laws? I think I'll abstain. Councillor Malcolm? No. Councillor McCall? Yes. Councillor Mifflin? Yes. Councillor Noon? Aye. Councillor Somerville? Yes. Councillor Weir? Yes. Councillor Wilson? Yes. And Councillor Roberts? Yes. yes. Stand it. Oh, sorry, you read that. Um, we have all four except for one against and one abstained. So two, four, six, eight, nine, four. Okay, yep, it has been one, it being uh, E there. Who did the other two be held all together? Yeah, that would be handy. <laughs> Segment. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're taking three and four okay. together. Uh, hopefully everyone got that online. Michael, is your hand up for some oh. reason, though? So no, we don't, oh, we don't do three yet. Actually. Can't do three. No, 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 no. no. Those, those, are left, those are left. That's oh, right. Yeah. They're out. Yeah. Three and four don't have to be put them. Oh, yeah, true. That's yeah. right. We yeah. need to. We might require the workshop, workshop before we think yeah. about them. That's right. Sorry. Yep. All done then. A point of clarity on this. I, I just, now, when do we have to have a workshop to make a decision on our work way forward? Uh, sorry, a council meeting uh, on the way forward, isn't it, isn't it the 12th of September or something? Yeah, so we've got a council, through the chair, there's a council meeting scheduled for the end of August, so that paper will come to that end of August council meeting and we'll look to arrange a workshop. It'll probably need to be a um, just a discreet uh, workshop outside of the council cycle and we'd probably do it online for those that um, weren't in Dunedin to fit with that schedule. And that will give time to make the decision before the 12th of September and then before the public notices are required. Mm. We can do this one over again. Right, we're going to move, well, I'll move that, and somebody hopefully seconds that we're going to adjourn for a short break, uh, five minute break. Yep, seconded, all in favour. I again, Ms. Carey. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.